So this evening, we're going to look at task four uh, being one of the uh, written tasks, and it's one that students uh, don't do as well as they would like, should we say. So we're going to look at that this evening. And then Wednesday evening, we will look at task six, which is the other written task as well. So we've gone through tasks two, three, four, and six. Task one and five are automatically marked. Task five is ratios. You've got to be looking to do well on ratios because um, you know they're going to be there. You're going to have to calculate them. You've got a finite list of what ratios they're going to test. Um, so you've got a good idea of what's going to come up in the exam there. Cool. So let's have a look at the Chief Examiner's Report um, for Task 4. Give me a minute. Now, you should be able to see my screen. I presume you can. I've done several thousand of these since lockdown. Um, but I assume it's coming through. Cool. So this is the yeah, chief examiner's report. So you can see here, um, it comes up with the account systems controls. Account systems controls are in like every unit because it's the unit. Um, but there's a lot of MDCL, decision and control. So you do have to revise uh, certain bits. We went through this the other day, certain bits from budgeting, decision control, financial statements. The lion's share of stuff from the previous three units that's in this exam is decision and control. Financial statements is pretty much ratios, and that's token effort. Decision control, if there's one unit you're going to spend a lot more time on revising, other than obviously counting systems and controls, it would be decision and control. So we've got our learning outcomes there. Um, in fact, we'll scroll back up to the top. We'll just look at overall performance we get into the actual nitty-gritty. You see here, it is what, along with task three, ones students don't do very well on. So you're looking at a third of students pass this task, so two thirds of them don't. And it is a tricky one. Um, so the, the problem is also there's an awful lot can come up in this task, whereas like task five is literally ratios, that's all it'll ever be. So we'll look at what comes up from decision control, but you can see it's quite open ended. So, you know, standard costing, you know, should be able to work out standard costings. Um, financial, non-financial performance techniques to aid decision making. So there's quite a lot can come in there and range of cost management techniques. So you can have things like target costing, cost benefit analysis that can come up. Um, there's loads of things that can be, and it can be quite number heavy, but quite wordy. So if when you look at where, where students do well, on the next page, calculations, that's what, you know, we're accountants, it's what we do. We do very well on that. Um, but you might get one that doesn't have any numbers, where some quite be, like I say, quite number heavy. Um, but then where students do struggle is non-relevant costs. Does, everyone, does anyone want to tell me what a non-relevant cost is? Quite a tricky one, this, actually. So this comes back to like a cost benefit analysis. Yeah, Suzanne. So that would be the uh, that'd be one um, non-relevant cost. So what, what you're doing when you do a cost benefit analysis, what you're doing is you are committed to another one, Olivia, is when you're looking at shall we do this project or shall we not? Then what you want to do is if we do this project, how much more money will we receive compared to if we don't so what you'll do is look at all the extra money you'll get in less all the extra costs that you will incur so say for example uh yeah we're looking at aem electric vehicles say for example it's not a massive uh leap of faith to go they want to do electric scooters say and the thing is, shall we invest in a new piece of machinery that creates um, electric scooters? And if they've done some research and development on how to um, build electric scooters, say, whether they then decide, 
and just say that research and development in the past, whether they did decide from today to, yeah, let's buy that piece of machinery so we can produce electric scooters, or then they go, no, actually, we don't think it's a market for electric scooters, let's not do it. That research and development has already been spent. So it's not relevant to whether they make that decision or not. It's not like they're going to incur extra research and development costs. It's already spent. So that's not relevant to the decision of to buy that piece of machinery that makes electric scooters. That's just what's known as a sunk cost. And as Sheena says, there's already committed costs. So say, for example, AEM had a spare bit of space in their factory where they go, do you know what? We could squeeze in a piece of machinery to make electric scooters. Now, their rent on their factory, they have to pay whether they buy that piece of machinery and start selling electric scooters or not. So if you're already going to have to pay it, if you make the decision as a yes or you don't make or you make the decision as a no, if you're already going to have to pay it, it's not relevant to the decision. It's just so the actual true definition of a uh, relevant cost is a future incremental cash flow. So it's in the future, it's incremental, i.e. on top of what you've already gone to get, and it's cash. So it's not like we put a provision in which might, I don't know, might reduce your profit, but it won't produce cash. So it's, yeah, it's got to be in the future, it's got to be incremental, and it's got to be cash, which is records. We had a very good addition of non-relevant, it's not future, it's not incremental or uncontrollable, and it's not cash. And when you get, if you get a cost benefit analysis, they will almost certainly give you quite a few relevant costs to do a calculation, but they will almost certainly be irrelevant costs or non-relevant, you should say. So things like there are manager's salaries. So if the manager is working on this, would have to work on this project, if you're paying them anyway, it's not relevant. Whereas if they have to do overtime, it's uh, relevant. Um, what other examples are there of uh, non-relevant costs? Um, so, you know, if you're already paying the staff, uh, if you've already paid it in, in advance, if it's part of your day-to-day -day expenses, like your rent, it's not relevant. It's, you know, if, like research, if you've already done it, it's irrelevant. Basically, anyway, that's quite a lot about non-relevant costs. Watch out for that. They do like throwing them in. Um, the... Inability to assess the wide implications of a financial decision. Um, yeah, when you're talking about financial decision, it's always a good idea to put at the end, you know, some sort of open-ended caveat of more, re you know, more research and development, you know, would be useful or market analysis. You know, something just uh, to don't look at the, that's it, and that's always going to be the fi the figures we ignore everything else, really. And like, I mean, this is specific to this task, not using the information provided in task data. So we all know we, we've got the, the scenario AEM and hopefully you've read it, but not spent your time learning because you don't, it's not a test of your memory. What's going to happen is in the task, something will happen or there's something that will be considering something. And that is what you want to base your question around. Really make it relevant to the scenario or the information given to you in the actual task. This is given to you for a reason. Cool. As you see here, it's now up to a third of people are passing this rather than a quarter. Um, you know, it, it is a tricky task, and this is where decision control. And unfortunately, there's quite a lot from decision control that can come up here. So the more question practice, the better, because you get more exposure to the different subjects that can come up. It's not like um, task three, which will be identifying weaknesses. This could be up quite a broad range of subjects so more question practice the better on this cool any questions on that before we get into our actual question for this evening hello cool so let's look at our scenario so they've bought Weldon Vehicles Limited and Alison and Chris want to show that, finance, that the performance reporting is consistent across the business and it co covers financial performance indicators as well as non-financial indicators. 
We want that um, and non-financial performance indicators using the balanced scorecard approach. So we'll come to that again, another thing from decision control. So to help staff get buy-in across the organization, Chris says, put some notes together. So the question is, explain the difference between financial performance indicators and non-financial performance indicators and explain why it's useful to consider both. Yeah, uh, just to to that, yes, you do need to involve parts of the balance scorecard, unfortunately, um, and you'll have, potentially have to apply that to a scenario. So before I would get into the question, we know what we need to do, explain the difference between financial performance indicators and non-financial performance indicators, and explain why it is useful to consider both, and then look at the marks available. It is worth three marks. So I would say we have three aspects to this question and three marks. So we're not looking for a massive essay on each one. We don't want to spend ages explaining to some financial performance indicators, non-financial performance indicators, and not do the last task. Because I would say, well, I'm not saying, I'm certain, there would be one mark for talking about financial performance indicators, one mark available for non-financial performance indicators, and one mark for why it's useful to consider both. If you give me three points about financial performance indicators and nothing else, you will not get three marks. I almost guarantee the mark scheme will be one for that, one for that, and one for that. So don't think just chucking more and more points is going to get you more marks. It will not. So let's. We, so what we're looking for, for one mark, I would say one well-explained point. Remember, back to our marks per minute, it is a three-hour exam. It's 180 minutes. And there are 100 marks available, so 1.8 minutes per mark. So nearly two minutes per mark. So we're spending roughly six minutes on this question, which I've probably used up half that time anyway now. Um, so we just want one well-explained point. So what are the characteristics of a financial performance indicator? Yeah, so these are based on... So that's what they are. And then what does that mean in terms of how we use them? Yeah, they're very tangible, i.e. they're very easy to get. So one would be gross profit margin. It's there. Yeah, great word, Susan. Quantitative. It's very easy to sort of measure and, and get the information. But Due to the nature of the financial statements, what else is a characteristic of them? Yep, you've got in there profitability, you've got liquid till it. Yes, that's the one I was looking for, Sheena. They are backward looking. So even if you're the best accountant in the world, um, you are on your year ends the 31st of March, you will not be preparing your financial statements on the 1st of April. You've got to wait for all the supplier invoices to come in. Potentially, um, if you're doing a bank rec, if you've got that sort of thing, you've got to wait for your bank statement to come through. Um, you've got to find time. They're always going to be backward facing. So the good in the fact that cold, hard facts that you can get from your statements, but at best, you're probably looking three months ago as terms of... Um, timeliness which nicely segues into the next well, obviously put this into a nice sentence um but that's what you'd look basically would say these are measurable in bits of information taken from the financial statements but due to the nature of them they are historically looking and that's it that's one mark so we need to stop that we have literally completed that mark you write something else about that will not get you another mark i guarantee it whereas what about non-financial performance indicators? Yes, Deborah, that's a great word. These are qualitative. That's such a good word. I have to check that out. You've spent it, spelt it, make sure I've got it right. Qualitative. But these are more forward-looking. What would be an example of a non-financial performance indicator?
Yeah, customer feedback. I think that's a great one because customer survey sort of thing. Because if you make a sale, you've got the money. It's in your financial statements. It's in your financial um, performance indicators. But if you've annoyed every customer you've ever had, you know, the odds are in the future, you're not going to make any more sales. Um, so, yeah, and if you bring it right back to scenario, returns issues on cars and things like that. So that's a great example of a non-financial performance indicator. And that's the reason why it is more forward looking than um, a, a financial performance indicator, because it's more what will happen in the future. Like staff morale is a great one. If you're, if you're uh, very much into research and development, say you're, I don't know, Apple, you know, spend billions on research and development but if all your top people leave we might have made loads of sales because you've developed the iphone 14 or something we're up to now um but if you can't produce the 15 16 17 in the future because all your staff have left you're in a world of trouble likewise so i'll do that that is for non-financial performance indicators stop there we've got that mark which means in the last bit why is it useful to consider both Yeah, they've got different and complementary information. Complementary. You know, for want of a better, yeah, you get a, like Rex says there, you get a better overall view, a more balanced opinion of what how it's been doing previously and how it's going to be going in the future. Uh, and it assesses you know, all the different aspects of what a business does. Is it profitable? Is it sustainable? It's all very good having the happiest customers in the world, but if they're happy because you're selling stuff at a loss, it's not sustainable. And it's all very really good. You know, you've sold loads of stuff to naive people, but if they're never going to come back and start slating you on social media, You've not got a long sustainable business either. And that is it. And that is three marks. Now, obviously, these are written tasks. You might have done something different. You might have talked about something else um, about financial performance indicators and non financial performances. You might have said non financial performance indicators are qu can be quite hard to measure because the inflation is not always there. Again, that would be a great point. But I wouldn't write three, four, five points about it because. The marks just aren't there, really. So we look, we look, we look at something similar, but not exactly the same. But structured in this way, you've got three three tasks to do effectively and three marks. So just be, let the mark scheme be, um, you know, a guide as to how you should structure your answer. Cool. Right, next one. Again, we'll break. The question requirement down, look at the mark scheme. So basically, they're looking at whether benchmarking could help manage improved performance. And we've been asked, what if benchmarking exercises, how it could be useful for Argent Electrical Motors, along with any disadvantages, plural, or difficulties, plural, they might face? And it's worth four marks how would you structure your answer yeah liz i would definitely do that i would yeah so i would have one mark one pen one mark there for what is a benchmarking exercise, how it could be useful. And then I would put two marks there. I would want to put two disadvantages or difficulties that they might face. Yeah, wreck it, exactly. That's how I would do it. Look at what the requirement is, look what the marks available, and then actually think, well, that's what I'm going to do. And then you can just tick these off as you've done them, rather than going down this rabbit hole of there's another difficulty, there's another difficulty, there's another difficulty. 
if you, if you can actually work out in your mind that it is going to only be two, um, really, I wouldn't put it in four, five, or six like that. A third one, maybe. I mean, I wouldn't say that an explain type question is worth less than one mark. If you get an identify or a state, I would say that's probably worth half a mark. So if that's worth half a mark, you want to bulk up the marks schemes for the rest of it. But if you've got an explain, you're looking for a very good, obviously, explain point. And that would be at least, you know, I'd say what one mark. So let's do it then. Right. Benchmarking exercise. So benchmarking exercise is basically you are comparing yourself against something meaningful. What could you benchmark yourself against? Yeah, what have you got? Yeah. Um, industry standard. If you can get industry figures, that is great. Uh, competitors, companies, house, and things like that is good for getting like financial information you can pay yourself on. Um, other competitors, other competitors, other departments, quite a good one. You know, if you've got a, I don't know, car making department. Um, well, you could do even th things like sickness. If you've got a car making department and a, I don't know, electric scooter making department, and one's always off sick, why? What's going on there? They overworked or they got low morale? Yes. Um, well, yeah, to a degree, Megan, I'd agree with that because what you would do is you can also benchmark yourself against yourself, but in the previous year. So you you can benchmark yourself against what other people are doing, but you can also benchmark yourself, yeah, Laura says, year on year, on what you did last year and go, actually, we want to do better than last year and set yourself some budget. It is basically measuring yourself against something else measurable. It must be measurable. If you can't measure it, you cannot benchmark it and then try to make some meaningful comparisons. Cool. So the next bit is, how could it be useful for Argent Electrical Motors? And I'm going to understand, underline that bit there. Not how is benchmarking useful. How is it useful, or could it be useful, for Argent Electrical Motors? What could you compare when you're making electric cars um, to comparing somewhere else? Yeah, I agree with the gross profit, but how is that specifically re related to what Argent Electrical Motors is? How could they use it? Yeah, I like that one, Michael. Battery life. It is specific to Argent Electrical Motors. So they could actually state it. And I would want to explain, um, then take that a little bit further. Emphasis on useful because there's no point doing this unless it benefits the company if it's like oh that's interesting and then you do nothing with it it's not useful yeah where you are in terms of products in the product life cycle um you know you could boost benefit comp you know, how performance is each showroom doing yes Really like that one, Deborah. You know, comparing you know the performance of electric cars to um, petrol cars. Um, yeah, Megan, that's really good. Maybe isn't a load of information available, so they do some benchmarking against competitors to start getting picking up some trends. Um, so basically, they could get you know why would it be useful? You could get market trends. of the electric car market, EV market. You know, you could look to see, you know, are there any failings in your EV vehicle and then improve performance of your cars? Yeah. 
Yeah, just playing the game. Yeah, you, I spend my whole life looking at what our competitors are doing. Um, yeah, but again, just one tangible usefulness or benefit, I think is a better way of phrasing it. I want one ben benefit from possibly using benchmarking. So the next bit, what difficulties or disadvantages could they face? One point I like, someone's already mentioned. Yeah, so it's, it's time consuming in itself. There's no two ways about that. Yeah, and it's a new market. So you might have, in the petrol market, you might have loads of competitors that have been showing up cars, producing sets of accounts uh, for years. But you, you know, this is a new market. It is a developing market. So you might have lots of, lots of information to hand. And also, I would say another one would be I think someone's mentioned this, not just new, but it's also fast paced. You know, years ago, if your electric car, well, in those days, it was a hybrid, uh, would, would do 30 miles on um, electric. You thought, wow, that's really good. Not many long times after you, cars that will do hundreds and hundreds of miles uh, on electric cars. You know, and that Tesla played thing, that can do not to 60 in under two seconds. It's mental. Um, you know, the market is really vast. So you might have some historical data, you know, that we're going back a year or two ago, and you're benchmarking yourself out of stuff that is out of date. Um, and things so I'd, I'd be wary of that. And I think someone else mentioned it as well. Yeah, I mean, obviously, if you're, who would you say? Tesla are pretty big. Uh, if you're a small company, I don't know, AEM, you're not going to compare yourself to Tesla. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to get the information, especially, I think someone mentioned it, um, non-financial data is quite hard to get to compare. Now, you're comparing staff morale, you might just have um, good staff and you're comparing them to last year. And they're like, oh, staff morale's dipped a little bit. But if they're still better than everyone else, they're not going to be leaving, are they? Whereas if you think, oh, staff morale's better than what it was last year, but as soon as they go for a job interview or anywhere else, they're like, my God, this company is amazing. They're all going to leave, even though you're proving it. Yeah, like I said, you know, internal information is quite hard to get hold of. Um, so there's lots of things, you know, that make it difficult. And again, it doesn't have, there's a massive list that we could do, but it just needs to be a potential well-explained difficulty that is relevant to AEM. Really. But um, but yeah, but, but then you can come up with your own whatever, but what you know, want to do want to stress is use that mark scheme to formulate your answer. I mean, I might put a third one just in case, but I, I honestly would think it's going to be one mark for an explain um, what it is, one mark for explain how it could be useful, and then two marks for, wait, it says they're definitely Plural, disadvantages of difficulties. Cool. What do you think to that? Do you think that would be doable if you got that in the exam? Now, obviously, your difficulties and whatnot, disadvantages, would be different to other people. That is totally fine, as long as they are sensible and relevant. It is doable. I mean, Professor Synoptic has this, like, awful reputation, and it is not an impossible exam. Um... In fact, if you read the AT Student Magazine, there's uh, an article in it this month when it comes out from me. Uh, and I say this first thing, get out of your mind. It's not an impossible exam. It has this stigma, which if you do the prep, you know exactly what the exam is looking for. You just give it to them. You just, just give the exam exactly what they want. Give them exactly the number of the points. Explain if it's explained. State if it's state. Just tick the box. You've got to play the game. Cool. So the next one, we won't spend a lot of time on the maths. It's pretty obvious. Um, you know, yeah, I would say actually, it's the way they word the question. 
So in these sort of questions, you know, you what's that there? Four marks. You're spending eight minutes on that. What you don't want to do is get three or four minutes in and you, you're back and actually you've gone off on a tangent about something else that's not relevant and you're not answering the question. You need to be very clear. What is the question you know, asking and make sure your answer answers that question. What the examiner cannot do is go, well, that's a really good point. Uh, I'll give you marks for that, even though it wasn't asked because they can't. So just make sure that you put your answer down once. And you'll be fine for time. If you have to redo an answer, you very quickly can get yourself into world of trouble with regards to time. Go off, go off on a tangent. For any of you that are going on to my tax course in May, I love going off on a tangent. Every other sentence is, you don't need to know this, but I'm going to tell you. Uh, anyway, we'll go down that route. Cool. cool, right. Next one is balance scorecard. Um, they may and probably will give you the four aspects of it as headers, but you definitely want to know them. So let's see what we have to do. So they are using the balance scorecard to measure measure performance so that's what they want to achieve but they want to make sure that everyone is aware of the specific targets they're working towards because you know if they don't know they can't work towards it and address issues that have become apparent so far so we need to suggest a key performance indicator that they could use and then explain why the measure you have suggested would, would help AEM manage performance so suggest isn't an explain type question so give a kpi you can literally just come up with one thing and just put it down and you'd get i would say at most half a mark but obviously for the full marks um you want to be explaining why now i would suggest here you've got half it's, it's it says here suggest a key performance indicator it's not suggesting performance indicators so you've got two marks for each performance indicator so put it down and then you want a really good explanation to get all two marks remember the previous one was one mark this is now two marks for you to explain your measure and it's the measure how it would help them ex, uh, manage performance and emphasis on managed performance. So financial perspective, give it to me. What could we measure as a KPI under the financial um, indicator? Yeah. Um, what have we got? It means it makes much difference, really. Um, Let's go with the first one. Honestly, if you can measure it and it's financial related, it's right. Um, what I would do, though, is make sure that if the one you choose, you can explain how it would benefit them in managing performance. So let's, like, without picking favourites, let's just go for the first one, which was gross profit margin. So let's bring this back to here. So how would this help AEM manage performance? So people need to know what they are working towards. So we're going to look at gross profit margin. And before I go, um, remember what gross profit margin is. And it can only be affected by two things. The only thing that will affect your gross profit margin is the price you sell it for per unit and the cost it, it takes to make it per unit. If you sell twice as many whatevers, you, well, electric cars in this case, and that you sell them for the same price and it costs the same price to make, the gross profit margin will not move. So volume does not affect gross profit margin directly. So if you, the only way that it can do it is if you double your volume, and then you get economies of scale or bulk buy discounts, that will help you reduce your cost per unit would then affect your gross profit margin. Yeah. 
So how could gross profit margin help you manage performance? There's two things there, basically. Sales price. Yeah. Or the cost price per year. Yeah. So I'll go with that. I think that's a good one. Yeah. So the first thing is look at costs. So what you can do is allow us to see if costs are rising and highlight that fact. And then we can investigate the reason why. So you can set, you know, we, we want, you could set your production manager, something tasks of we want to achieve a 20% margin. And they have to look at efficiencies in terms of direct labor, in terms of materials and things like that. What about the other side of gross profit margin? What could we, what could we manage there? Pricing decisions, exactly. Come on in. And you, know, you could look at pricing decisions and then from that, are you offering any discounts? So, you know, you might have a sales manager that goes, look at me, I've sold two million pounds worth of stuff this month. But if they've had to offer deep discounts to get them, their performance will not be as great as if they'd managed to sell two million pounds worth and without the discounts. Yeah. So there's two things there. You know, if you put them into life's coherent senses without scribble all over and lines, you would probably get both marks there. Um, next one, customer's perspective. What is a KPI we could measure for customer's perspective that would allow us to manage performance? Yeah, someone was first with that. We'll go with that. Megan, customer, customer surveys or feedback. Now, as a KPI, you need to measure it. So what would you measure about customer feedback? Ah, excellent point, Han. Yeah, after sales satisfaction uh, in the pre-release materials. Yeah, Liz, let's go with that. Number of ratings that give full marks, that is measurable. Or number of complaints, either way. Um, let's go with Liz, because more positive. <laughs> so, so we can measure that. Five star reviews. That's meant to be a star, by the way. Trust me, that's the star. Right, so we've identified our KPI that we have. And that's not to say, actually, other suggestions like number of complaints, number of repairs, and things like that, they're not equally as valid. Um, I just had to pick one. And again, you might come up with loads. You have to pick one because it asks for a key performance indicator. You give two key performance indicators and don't explain either of them, you will get very few marks. We work one performance indicator and one explanation. Double it up is just wasting your time in the examiners because they're ignore it. So if you're measuring your five number of five-star reviews you get, how will that allow you to measure performance or what performance could you manage based on that? Yeah, so you'd, I like that. I like that, Angel. Um, so you can measure your after sales performance and look at training. We want two hours.
I think that's a really good point. So, Sam, Han, Han pointed out, um, you know, it, it, it's a very good point. It's, it's, it's in the pre release. It's quite a good thing to look at. Um, so, I'll see a little bit. Um, so, you can measure that. You can then act on it and deal with it. And you can say to people, you know, you know, our after sales service, what went wrong? Then you've got a measurable something we can do about it and like, offer training and things like that. I wouldn't say any more to that, to be honest. You've got a KPI you can measure and you're saying how it will help manage performance. This is that. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't write any more because you're not going to get any more marks than that. There's only two marks available and it's only one for one KPI. Next one, internal business processes. Uh, yeah, I, did, I didn't think of that one, Michael, but I think that is a great one. So what would you measure though? Hang on. Inventory days is another good one. Um, yeah, uh, I'm trying to think of a yeah percentage of people who pay in 30 days, so or something like that. On the percentage of people who pay over that, yeah, the number of overdue invoices, percentage of overdue debt. Yeah. So, I mean, whilst there's different KPIs um, that we want to look at, I mean, different subjects, you know, staff retention is always really important. There's different ways you can measure credit control. As long as it's measurable, it's, it's fine. Like number of overdue invoices, like I can say, is perfectly fine. You've got to pick something. So how will that help manage performance? So what we'll be assessing, looking at KPI. Indirectly cash flow. Um, Emily, I agree with you there, but I think it was more the what to. Um, yeah, we would assess the performance of our credit control staff or procedures. And what will that allow us to do? Yeah, really good one. Uh, who's that? Um, yeah, improve the cash flow, reduce bad debts. Two great answers. So improve cash, decrease bad debt. Great answer, actually. So we've got the, what would we, we, we measure? What does it allow us to manage? And then what would be the benefits of doing that? Great. I would definitely just say, well, you wouldn't be marking your own work. But if I was, I'd give myself full marks on that. I think we've got a really good point. Well explained. You can see what we would do and what the benefits it would be and how we manage in performance. Cool. And I wouldn't write any more. What about... The last one, innovation and learning. Yeah, let's go with that because I think everyone's done that. Uh, staff retention. Now, I think you all know this, but what would, what would you measure in staff retention as an actual measurable KPI? Yeah, that's a good one. Number of people leave within a year. Um, yeah, the length of time staff say, percentage of staff who leave during the year. Um, turnover staff, basically, what percentage of staff are here that were here this time last year? That kind of, yeah, anything you could mention. 
Uh, but we'll just go with you know, kind of a percent, potential percentage of levers. And we'll go with that. So what does that help us manage in terms of performance? There's a few things, to be fair, that suddenly come to me. Yeah, so it help us manage staff morale. Yeah, and then we can help them understand why they leave. So if people leave, maybe have an exit interview or something like that. Why people leave. I mean, the other thing you do also look at is your recruitment the issue? Uh, are you getting the wrong people? Are they not being aware of what they're getting themselves in for? Um, and then if you really want to take it to the nth degree, what would be, yeah, exactly, Megan, what would be the real benefit of improving this? Reduce recruitment costs is one, spend time on the last, spend less money on staff training. Um, have more experienced, more efficient staff. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if you want to bring in the reference material there, really good um, point, actually. I think that's a really good point, Liz. Uh, bring that in there. If you can always take it back to the scenario. You know, if you think, actually, this is quite a technological industry um, and... It's a new industry, so there won't be loads of people kicking around who've been working in this industry for 20 or 30 years. Uh, you know, it's probably people who've relatively recently moved into this industry from I don't know, petrol cars to electric cars kind of thing. So, yeah, as you say there, you know, you've got more experienced staff. And so you've got you know, better staff. You've got the recruitment costs. Um, you know, rec recruitment agents licensed to print money. It's just shocking what they charge uh, i don't see the need for recruitment agents in the world um improve efficiency so there take it to the nth degree you know manage performances and what would be the actual real world benefits to aem and if bring it back to the industry as much as possible really just don't make your answers really generic but but yeah cool so that is it for task four now when I say this, this is task four for this mock. Task four is it's not like um, like a task three where you're going to have to identify weaknesses. You could get the balance scorecard. You could get um, you know explain benchmarking that kind of stuff. You could get some form of non financial cost benefit analysis. You got to worry about um, you know what's the non financial benefits of electric scooters maybe i don't know um or you could get financial ones and you've got to do some relevant non-relevant costs sort of calculations it's one that if i had to choose spend do as many of these as possible to give as much experience for this sort of wide breadth of question types you can get in this one um it, it, and as you can see from the performance it, it's one that students do struggle with cool but going through it together and looking at the mark scheme, how do you feel about that? Yeah, are there more, well, for a start, we've got four mocks. So if you're a first intuition student, you should have two in your folder, two online. We do have extra questions uh, on these. Um, well, it's not anything. So like group accounting for that statements will never come up at all, never mind in this task, but it's decision control. And the AAT sample assessments, which are, are they are not based on the real assessment for whatever reason, um, but it's still good practice to do them. Um, so you've got, if you're a first intuition student, you've got six mocks to be going at. If you're not a first intuition student, we sell a mock product for 15 pound, can't go wrong for that. Um, but yeah, it, this really is question practice. And remember, if you do a mock and your answer is different to the model answers, do not assume 
that it's all wrong because it's not. Because as we saw tonight, it's asked for one KPI. Uh, and we gave loads. Uh, on the FI learning material, have the lectures been uploaded to Rise and literally everything that could come up? The answer to that is no, because um, there's an awful lot. But if you're a first impression student, you should have access to budget and decision control and financial statements. If it's timed out, just ask, we'll extend it. Um, because basically, if we pretty much gave you everything that could come up in the synoptic unit from um, from the other units would effectively be giving away decision control for free because it's nearly all decision control, really. Uh, but you... If you're first interested, I've actually got a doc. Go through the learning specifications. If you're not a first interested student, you can see what you uh, need to learn. But if you're first interested student, drop me an email if you haven't got it already. There is a document that says exactly what comes up when and where in each task. And I've got it and I'll send it out to you. Uh, but I tell a lie. I feel nice. Um, I will send it out with the recording of this. So everyone's got a copy of my guide to the synoptic exam of what comes up when and where, on which that goes out tomorrow. Uh, what are the questions that we got? Um, so, so we can see it. Yeah, so if you're a first interested student, there's the task bank, mocks one, mocks two in your folder, mocks three and four online that come through or marking, and we'll mark them and do that. Uh, in terms of six mocks, the other two are on the AAT sample, uh, sorry, AAT learning portal, which are not based on AEM, annoyingly, um, but they are what they are. If you BPP, um, like I say, I've got our mock bank for £15. Um, you get two mocks. And the way they work, actually, just as a shameless plug, is when you do an AT sample assessment, they you'll get competent or not yet competent. And um, that is literally based on what it can mark automatically, which in terms of PDSY is task two and five. And it just ignores the written task. So it's basically, did you get 70% on task two and five? Whereas our mock bank, which if you're a first intuition student, do not buy because you've already got it. Um, you can do your mock or three hours, do it properly. And then you can mark your task uh, two, three, five, and six using our mark scheme. And then you will get a competent or not yet competent based on the overall grade, including your written stuff, not just task one and five, the automatically marked ones. Cool, I'll send a link to that. Yeah, fifteen pound. You know, price of exams nowadays. You don't be failing these. But what other questions have we got? Uh, yeah, if you sign up for this, Sheena, which you must be because you got the link, we will send out the recording. The revision sessions are online, and um, there are actually also recordings of other revision sessions online. They're not based on um, the same structure that we did them last year, but the. The theory of it is exactly the same and the points for them are well worth doing. Yeah, there's loads of questions kicking around. Cool. Yeah, and like I said, I will send out... Um... Ah, in terms of our mock, you get the mark scheme once you've done the exam. So you'll, you'll do your mock and then you will say, now you need to mark it and you can see the solutions and marking guidance, then you can do it. Uh, is there an option to have the recording with the first session? Um, yeah, I can get that sent out along with the mark scheme. Uh, Megan, it will be marked today. I'll make sure it's time. It's seven o'clock. We're here for another hour. Don't worry, you'll get it back. Um, I'm not sending the answers to this because you'll get the recording, which has our answers. Um, our model solutions has some answers, but it's this. It's not like uh, statements where your provision for unrealized profit is wrong because it's not the same as model answers. As long as it's sensible and relevant, you know, we give some suggested answers, but there's loads. You know, how many financial KPIs could you measure? You could measure hundreds of them. Um, that. Uh, 
Wednesday, we will do, come on. So we're gonna skip task five because it's just ratios. You know, you should be pretty clued up on these because they're in every unit and you know they're gonna be there. We're gonna do task six, which is, if we can get to it. Come on. So what we're gonna do, so. Yeah, yeah we've got a cost benefit analysis. So see, uh, I'm not gonna go through it, but there, there will be non-relevant costs in here um, for this. Yeah, I just wonder if they're up on YouTube as well. Yeah, I'll make sure they're sent out whether they're on a re Zoom recording or YouTube. Yeah. Uh, do we have... Yeah, we offer ACCA online, online live classroom as well. Oh, they're on YouTube already. Yeah, definitely watch them on YouTube because then it bumps up our YouTube reviews. Do you know an interesting fact? You might not think it's interesting, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Our revision session recordings on YouTube have had half a million views. Literally like Mr. Beast. Cool. Right. Um, I'll get the link sent out so you've got it all. Uh, yeah, you should have, you can have a go at this, and then I'll go through this uh, on six o'clock on Wednesday evening as well. Yeah, that's the promise optic that just changed. Um, but they are out there. Come on, set it up. Cool. Anyway, right, before I'm any more rambling, I will let you all go. I'll send out my guide to everything that you need to know at what point in the synoptic exam. I'll send out recordings of the previous ones. Um, and then I'll see you all Wednesday evening, six o'clock.